Hello, welcome to this section, Introduction to ASIC Design. Over the uh, next few videos, I plan to uh, cover the topics on this page. I'm going to talk, talk about silicon, the silicon industry, uh, and some of the underlying trends. Then I'm going to turn to application-specific circuits, uh, uh, what they are and what they aren't. I'm going to talk about ASIC design flows uh, and uh, finish off with some more comments about trends. The learning objectives in this module are first of all to understand Law's Law and its impact on the silicon industry. Second, identify the defining attributes of full custom, standard cell uh, and gate array ASICs from a design and fabrication cost perspective. Identify the key steps in designing an ASIC and identify the challenges facing the ASIC industry. This is a introductory module and it's intended to give you an overall view of the industry uh, and uh, the ASIC portion of it in, in, in general uh, and also introduce you to the design flow. The references are as follows. Uh, the Saletti has some sections that are relevant. And of course, there's general references uh, available on the web. Uh, the ones I recommend here are, are generally trade magazines or blogs, uh, E Times, Electronic Design, Electronic Products, and uh, Deep Chip. Uh, if you go to these, you'll find lots of interesting articles related to uh, the content in this uh, section. So this is a topical outline. And the first two points we're going to cover in this video uh, is an introduction to uh, engineer, engineer systems and complexity. Uh, and then we'll get into Moore's Law uh, and what that means in terms of the uh, silicon industry in the past, today, and in the future. So let's compare two of mankind's crowning achievements. Uh, the Saturn V rocket, which uh, of course took man to the moon in the 1960s and 70s, and uh, the A100 graphics engine, a high-end graphics engine actually intended for AI and blockchain applications from NVIDIA. The Saturn V rocket, and the question is, which is more complex? Saturn V rocket has 3 million parts and had a development cost in today's dollars of 2 to 3 billion. The A100 graphics engine has 54 billion transistors, a, a many order of magnitude increase over the Saturn V rocket, and a development cost in today's money of the same, 2 to 3 billion dollars, but that's just for this particular product. This is on top of uh, many hundreds of billions of dollars of R&D and semiconductor fabs, uh, uh, fabrication technologies, uh, design technologies, and so forth. So the question for you, which is more complex? And I'm not going to pick one for you. Uh, both of these are some of the more complex engineered artifacts uh, designed by mankind. But I do want to emphasize that one of them is what the subject of this course is about. That is designing these high-end chips or mid-range or low-end chips, we'll get into that later, uh, for various applications uh, that enable the digital revolution that's been probably been in existence for most of your life uh, and, and has had a dramatic influence on mankind. And is continuing and will continue uh, for, for the coming decades. You've probably heard of Moore's Law. Uh, and it's really an observation that has had long-lasting uh, long standing power. Uh, this is a graph from Moore's, Gordon Moore's original paper, uh, published in uh, 1966. What he observed is that if you trace back to the beginning of the silicon industry in 1959, there was ex there's been continued exponential growth in the number of components per integrated function. And he took this uh, through uh, uh, 2 to the 0, which of course is 1 transistor, through to 2 to the 6, uh, and observed that this, this, log, this, this exponential relationship, growth relationship, it was in existence, and predicted it would continue. Of course, uh, few thought it'd continue for over 50 years, uh, but it has, and it will continue uh, even beyond uh, the, the, the end of this decade. So the basic observation is the number of transistors per silicon chip uh, improves uh, at a constant rate, at an exponential rate, I should say, 
And the gate delay and also power consumption also improves at, at a certain rate. So transistors to chip are increasing around 50% per year and this traces back to the 1960s. Traditionally, cost per transistor decreased at the same rate, uh, though that trend has halted. I'll, I'll give some data on that in a moment. And gate delay decreases by about 13% per year. That is about 50% every five years. This is slowing down a bit as well, but actually is continuing. So we have a number of trends, uh, transistor density, uh, cost per transistor, gate delay, and actually power consumption as well. They are on an exponential curve. And this rate of performance will continue beyond 2030, except for the cost factor. So this has been an amazing uh, impact on this industry. Uh, it basically means that every two to three years, it's worth, worth everyone's while to redesign all, all high-end products or all products that, have, uh, that are performance-driven, microprocessors, GPUs, many ASICs, uh, many application-specific products and so forth. Uh, this, of course, leads to uh, tremendous employment of, of sophisticated engineers uh, and, uh, uh, and the continued digital revolution in terms of capability of compute power. So th this, is, this is a big driving force this industry uh, and uh, this prediction goes back to the 1960s. Next, I'll introduce the concept of transistor node. Uh, this is a single metric that characterizes different transistor technologies. Uh, and what it really does is roughly predicts the, trans the, the uh, performance of the parts fabricated in that node. So the transistor node refers to a fabrication technology. You talk about uh, going to global foundries and using their 28 nanometer technology, or going to TSMC and using their 7 nanometer technology, or going to Intel and using their 22 nanometer technology. And just by that one number, you get a fairly good idea, or at least once you're experienced in this, as to uh, what that uh, means in terms of performance. And frankly, also in terms of the, the technology mix that's properly being used. However, what it exactly means has changed over time. For nodes that which are identified as being a 20 nanometer or above, uh, the node indicates the metal half pitch, the metal one half pitch. Now, here's a diagram illustrating this. Uh, here we have two wires in metal one. The pitch is given here. And you can see the half pitch is approximately the metal width. Uh, though that's not the actual metric, it's half pitch. And so it, above 20 nanometer, it actually relates to a physical geometry uh, in the uh, layout of the, of the, uh, of the uh, circuit being fabricated. There are two basic technologies. There are variations of these, uh, but the two basic technologies in these, uh, in these uh, older nodes uh, there's uh, what's called bulk silicon. Here we have a CMOS device. You might recall a CMOS device, uh, electrons or holes uh, uh, traversed uh, in a channel from the source to the drain. And that channel and the conductivity in that channel is modulated by a gate. The gate can turn off the channel uh, so there's no conduction or turn it on so there's strong conduction. There's also what's called SOI or silicon on insulator. Is called that because there's an insulator uh, buried uh, beneath the gate channel. Uh, there's variants of SOI. The one I illustrate here is fully depleted. That means that this channel is thin in the vertical dimension. And it's thinner than two depletion regions. So it, it can become fully depleted of carriers. But again, the basic function is the same. Uh, the voltage on the gate modulates the, the, the channel and modulates uh, the current in the channel uh, formed by electrons or holes. Common nodes that use these uh, uh, types of transistors are 22 nanometer, 28, 45 and 65, 90, 130 and 180. And people still fabricate uh, device circuits in all of these nodes. Uh, there's often various reasons to use the older, coarser nodes uh, which we'll get into a bit later. Uh, the nodes at 45 nanometer and above are sometimes called legacy nodes because they've been around for a while, uh, but there's still uh, a lot of uh, uh, capacity being produced in those nodes. Well, once we got beyond the 20 nanometer node, 
uh, things started to change both in terms of the transistor to design and also what we meant by a node. The nodes at 14, 10 uh, and 7 uh, and, and 5, so some companies have a 5 nanometer node, are what are called uh, FinFET nodes. Or, well, not called, fin, are called FinFET nodes because instead of the planar FETs that you saw on the previous page, the uh, filter effect transistor, the gate is, is, is fabricated as a fin. The channel between the source and the drain lies in this fin. The gate surrounds the channel on three sides. Again, there's still an oxide here, it's just, uh, as you see it by this dark region. Again, the, the voltage on the gate modulates the current in the channel. Because the gate, uh, in, instead of lying above the channel, surrounds the channel on three sides, you get a more uniform electric field, uh, which improves the speed and current density over that of a, a bulk or traditional SOI transistor. But in these nodes, the metal half pitch and transistor size stops shrinking. This is due to the limits of lithography, which we'll get to uh, later in this uh, module uh, in another video. So these nodes, 14, 10, and 7, and so forth, have no feature that's actually at this dimension. Instead, they each represent one node equivalent of improvement in gate delay and power consumption over the previous node. Roughly a 25% improvement per generation. So, so for example, to introduce the 14 nanometer node, uh, the major fabs introduced these FinFET geometries uh, and uh, they didn't shrink the transistors much at all and they didn't shrink the metal layers, um, uh, at least the standard metal layers, but they, uh, uh, they uh, uh, were able to achieve a 25% improvement over the 22 nanometer node so it's called a nude node, and it's called the 14 nanometer node. And, and this continues on. Uh, the more advanced nodes that are still coming down the track, the numbers are representing the rate of improvement over the earlier nodes, not a change in any physical geometry. Beyond the 7 or, or 5 nanometer nodes, we're going to the, what we call the gate all around nodes. These are already in advanced R&D. The basic idea is here again we show the planar transistor, such as the bulk transistor. Here we show a fin FET, where the channel is a fin. In the gate all around nose, the channels have the gate surrounding it on four sides, not three sides. And, and the channels themselves are multiple ribbons that pass through the gate. This leads to a further increase in current density and thus performance and, and potential power savings uh, and, uh, and, 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 and thus the improvement is equivalent to a nodal improvement. So these are used at the, particularly the 3 and 2 nanometer nodes, the 2 nanometer node is just starting to come out. There's multiple names used for these uh, uh, structures, uh, gate all around is, is, is the uh, official name. But they're sometimes also called nano sheet or nano wire or nano ribbon transistors because the channels are sheets or, or uh, going through the gate. Here's a cross section of an, from an IBM publication about their two nanometer node that they've just introduced uh, in R&D. What you see here are three nano sheets uh, or gate all around structures. The width of the transistor is 40 nanometer. Uh, there's no, there's, these are not two nanometer size transistors. Uh, the gate, uh, each, each gate, uh, including the channel and the oxide, has its vertical dimension about five nanometers. But again, this is a two nanometer node. Uh, this illustrates that uh, there's actually nothing, there are uh, nanometric, nanometer size features in the gate oxides, for example but uh, the transistor size, the transistor footprint, or the metal footprint are, are pretty much back uh, to what they were at the 22 nanometer node. I said I'd talk about cost per transistor, and it's worth noting that the cost per transistor stopped improving 
at the 28 nanometer node, at least according to this particular graph from IBM. This is the cost per 100 million gates. Uh, so uh, this means that each gate's in the microcent range. Uh, we have dramatic decreases in cost per gate until the 28 nanometer node, where we have a slow increase. We're still increasing the number of transistors per wafer or, per or per chip in these more advanced nodes, but the cost of fabrication is going up at a much faster rate than the uh, transistors per area is going up. So the cost per transistor is going up slowly. Uh, now building these, these fabs, uh, building a seven nanometer fab is a multi-billion dollar adventure. Uh, and uh, so there's a lot of sunk cost in that, which translates to increased cost per device. Uh, this will probably continue uh, the, the cost per transistor uh, as we keep scaling uh, will uh, uh, continue to be flat. Uh, this does not mean that advanced nodes are not worth it because you get increased performance from the increased transistor count, the increased gate speed, and the decreased power consumption that you can achieve. The question of what's beyond the uh, uh, two nanometer node, and particularly what's at the one nanometer node and beyond that, is a research question. Uh, the next few slides will talk about a number of research directions uh, that will lead to one nanometer and beyond uh, levels of performance. One of these is replacing the silicon in the channel with what's called a 2D material. 2D material has uh, asymmetric geometry, crystal geometry. Uh, where the material has uh, layers of atoms or layers of sheets of atoms that are stacked. Uh, for example, graphene, as is used in lead pencils, uh, is a layer of sheets of carbon. Uh, and that's one of the materials being investigated, though the other materials uh, seem more likely. The advantage of these 2D materials, because uh, the way they can find the electrons, uh, have further increases in, uh, in current density and mobility and so forth. Uh, so it can lead to further increases in performance, which gives the potential for nodal scaling uh, just due to that factor alone. In addition, there's a number of uh, 3D uh, aspects that are coming in uh, and also new gate, jump, gate structures. For example, in advanced stages of research right now, uh, what we call these uh, fork sheet transistors. Here, an N device is co-fabricated with a P device right next to it using nanosheet transistors. Uh, this allows an increase in density of the transistors over uh, trad traditional fin fits or nanosheets. And what people are looking at now is the stacking of N fits and P fits. So here we have an N fit stacked with a P fit. Uh, and uh, and that, if you know anything about CMOS circuit design, uh, that, that is a very powerful combination. 3D packaging and 3D transistor stacking is also coming into play. Right now we're around here where we can make transistors or, or circuits in different um, wafers and uh, stack them using wafer to wafer bonding. And we're transitioning to uh, technologies that allow stacking of transistors, uh, more than just stacking of NFETs and PFETs in an organized fashion, but more generalized stacking uh, using various techniques to uh, control the uh, uh, thermal management of the semiconductor process. These images are taken from this IEDM paper cited here. Uh, 3D is being very helpful in a number of forms. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, stacking of NFETs and PFETs to increase density. Uh, these images are taken from this Intel paper. Um, the paper on the previous page was from IMEC. Uh, and here, for example, you see a, a CMOS inverter in a conventional nanoribbon technology and in a stacked nanoribbon technology. You can see you get a 2x uh, density improvement. As I mentioned, a number of groups are investigating uh, consolidated 3D stacking where, where you fabricate different layers on top of each other. Uh, one very powerful technique that is emerging is integrating high density memory uh, with uh, CMOS, stacked CMOS circuits. What this is taking advantage of is there are some memory technologies such as resistive memory and magnetic memory uh, that can be uh, uh, fabricated on top of CMOS transistors quite readily because they need lower fabrication technologies. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, this is sometimes referred to as heterogeneous integration. Uh, and this is a research dimension right now. This, this paper is from MIT and Stanford. Uh, but there's a lot of potential uh, for 3D stack technologies to provide continual uh, Moore's Law scaling. The advanced packaging version of 3D, uh, for example, uh, what's called hybrid bonding, uh, is also very powerful. Uh, hybrid bonding is a copper-copper bonding of planar copper struct planar surfaces uh, to create bonds between uh, two wafers or, or a chip on a wafer face-to-face uh, -face connected to each other. Here is actually a, a scan SEM photo uh, from one of our projects where we use hybrid bonding. These are two wafers stacked on top of each other. Uh, the hybrid bonds are here, uh, giving a high density connection uh, between the face of one wafer and face of the other wafer. FEOL uh, means front end of the line, that's the transistor layers are up here and down here. BEOL means back end of the line, that is the interconnect layers uh, here and here. So these are two wafers uh, joined together in a face-to-face -face configuration to make a 3D processor uh, that we designed in, in, uh, here at NC State and fabricated and built and actually worked. Um, and this is an advanced technology, advanced packaging uh, form of 3D technology. The beauty of uh, this hybrid bonding is uh, it allows you to rethink 2D circuits in a 3D fashion. So here's uh, some recent work we did uh, where we took uh, an FFT chip designed as a 2D circuit in, uh, in, in the 28 nanometer technology and redid it as a two chip stack with the hybrid bonds being the green dots for the signals. Uh, there are the, there's other hybrid bonds for power and ground. By doing this redesign, we could uh, decrease the power consumption by 21%, decrease the total silicon area, not just the footprint, but decrease the total silicon area by 11%. And this is really enabled by uh, the substantial, significant decrease in routed wire length. Uh, and so here we're showing uh, using 3D technology, a packaging 3D technology. Uh, giving about a, a Moore's Law uh, generation improvement uh, in uh, power uh, and uh, uh, an area. Another research dimension that's being investigated are what are called negative capacitance fats, FETs. This is done by incorporating a ferroelectric material in the uh, gate oxide. Ferroelectric material gives a nonlinear um, uh, CV relationship. Uh, and uh, uh, think of think of a transformer in a way, um, and uh, and this means that the uh, uh, the dynamic capacitance is is negative in certain regimes, uh, and this course can lead to an increase in speed and a decrease in power if you can work out how to operate in those regimes. So that's another research dimension. This is a paper from Berkeley. Um, uh, the uh, uh, in in going to one nanometer and beyond. So that brings us to the end of this module. Uh, again, I argue that silicon chips is, was one of the most important technologies ever developed by mankind. It's led to very dramatic improvements, generation after generation of digital and analog circuitry. Uh, and, and this, of course, means high employment uh, for semiconductor engineers. And this will continue uh, well beyond 2030 due to some of the research dimensions that I've just been discussing. The, con the exponential growth in transistor density that, that, that this investment in technology is allowed, sometimes referred to Moore's Law. Uh, and this is, Moore's Law has continued from its identification in the 60s uh, and has profound implications on the growth of digital processing, again, to enable the technologies you're used to and the technologies that are coming, such as more autonomous systems, uh, virtual reality and so forth. Uh, today this is largely scaling in performance and power uh, and transistor count uh, but um, uh, but th this is this is uh, uh, but the, the, these these are still very important dimensions. Well, that's the end of this sub module. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you can go on watching the next sub module 
or, or go and take the quiz uh, before doing so. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.